Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like you guys to do a little uh, uh, thought activity with me. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about the last person who you would want to see in a dark alley all by yourself. Go on, close your eyes. You got it? Don't think too hard about it. You'll ruin the rest of the sermon. Okay, now I want you to think about the person that you wouldn't want to see in an alley in broad daylight, surrounded by police and personally protected by Chuck Norris. For me, that fearsome individual's name is Shifu Roger. I know, chills down the spine, right? Okay, <clears throat> as a youth, I was really heavily involved in martial arts. And, and a lot of the guys in my kung fu class with me, we would kid around because we were close friends. You know, we, we weren't really the most disciplined bunch. So we would, we would be chatting and kind of goofing around while we're doing our practicing and stuff. And, and my teacher, Shifu Ken, uh, one day when we were being particularly rambunctious, he started telling us the, the story, the, the legend of Shifu Roger. Now, Roger was in class with my teacher uh, when they were both still, you know, starting out. And Roger was known for two things. One, that he did not look particularly athletic, but he moved like a rabid mongoose. And two, he was the most vicious, sadistic, vile human being when it came to uh, martial arts practice. He, he loved to work people out to the point that they couldn't hardly breathe. They were barely standing under their own power. And then he would set them up in line and he would spar with each one of them while they were dead tired. And when he would spar with them, I don't mean he would spar to teach them about martial arts. He would spar to teach them a lesson. Read the connotation. And, and his favorite thing was to, to grab an arm or a leg with his claws. He had claws. Remember, this is a legend. And he would twist until he could extract the most exquisite screams and yelps of pain from his students. This was Shifu Roger. And so this legend of Shifu Roger, this reputation of his, uh, led us to be a little bit more uh, disciplined in our classes for a time until a couple of years later, we all kind of looked at each other and said, you know, I wonder if this guy is even real. He's never come by. I don't know that this is even, you know what? Let's just go back to the way that we were. So, so one day, I show up to my Kung Fu class. I'm about 15 minutes early. I go downstairs and I'm, I'm getting ready to stretch to get ready for practice. And there's, there's a man in the back corner that I've never seen before. And, and he just looks like a guy that came in off the street who, who just wants to get involved in our class. I figured he was a new guy. So he's back there and he's stretching and he's just kind of looking lazily at the wall, doesn't really seem to know what to expect out of the day. So I walk over to him and I was going to introduce myself and be kind and, you know, hey, welcome to the class. I was going to ask him his name, etc. And I, as I go over to him and extend my hand to shake his, this cold, prickly feeling came over the air in the room. And as my hand got clammier and clammier, I changed my mind about the handshake and I took a half step back instinctively because I knew something was wrong. And, and as I was about to ask him his name, he just, he, he took his gaze away from the brick that he was trying to melt out of his mind, and he looked over at me, and very calmly, very serenely, said, don't you bow to teachers when you come in the room in this class? It was Roger. Now, I learned very quickly that his reputation was earned. That this was, this was really one of the scariest guys ever. It, his reputation preceded him. And so I knew somehow instinctively to fear this man. And, and I was right to do so. But not all reputations are negative. Some reputations are positive and they are also earned. A reputation is always earned. The reputation that Christ had earned was due to all of the healings and all of the teaching that he had been doing throughout the land in his ministry. And in our gospel lesson today in the book of Luke, we hear that a centurion, which is a strange target for the words of God, 
a centurion had heard about the healings of Christ. And, and this was very interesting to him because he had a servant who was dear to him who had fallen ill to the point of almost dying. Now, this centurion was a smart guy. He said, if I just go to Jesus, he'd probably look at me and say, what am I going to do with this fella? So he sent the elders of the synagogue to go and plead his case to Jesus Christ, to ask for healing for the servant of his. Now, this is interesting for many different reasons. First of all, a centurion is a Roman soldier who is in charge of a group of a hundred soldiers. And these Roman soldiers, their responsibilities would be keeping the peace in a Roman-ruled, Jewish-settled area. So, it's rather impressive that a centurion, a man who would be in charge of repressing and occupying Jewish lands, would have the reputation with these Jewish elders to be able to go to them and ask them to do him such a favor. Would you please go to Jesus and tell him that I need his healing power? Now, these Jewish elders, they did this for him because they considered the centurion worthy because of his actions. Now, his reputation also had been earned. His actions, uh, you could see why they would call him worthy. First of all, they saw his care for their nation, which would have been highly unusual for a centurion who is expected to repress these very people. And it probably led to his ridicule amongst his cohorts. The other centurions probably looked at him and said, <laughs> this guy's sympathizing with the enemy. This wouldn't have helped his cause. Secondly, the Jewish elders saw this centurion's care for his slave, for his worker. Now, interestingly, the word that is used in the original Greek for the centurion's servant is not doulos, which is the word in Greek for slave. It was pais, which is the word for young boy. Now, this is the kind of word that might be used to describe, say, the, the shieldsman for a knight. You know, someone who was very close to them, almost treated as family. They also saw the centurions care for their nation in his order to build them a synagogue in their town. Now this is way outside of the responsibilities of a centurion, not something that you would expect him to do. So all of these things were, they showed him to be different. And so these Jewish elders, these, these elders of the synagogue were willing to go and use the cachet that they thought that they had with Jesus because you're Jewish, I'm Jewish, do me a favor, huh? They got to use that in order to help out this centurion. But they did this on behalf of their concept of righteousness, of worthiness. And that is the, the acts of the man. But upon Jesus getting closer to the house of the centurion, this centurion sent out not more Jewish nationals, but his Gentile friends, his, his foreigners, his people. He sent them out to Jesus to tell Jesus Christ, who was on his way to do this service for him, he said, I'm not worthy to have you under my roof. Don't go any further. Don't go out of your way. That's interesting as well. But, but beyond that, the soldier said this not to tell Jesus, I don't actually want you to heal my servant. He said this because he knew that Jesus could heal his servant with a word. Just like that, he knew that Jesus Christ had the authority to simply say the word and the healing would be done. He had heard of these acts of healing of Jesus Christ. He had heard the reputation of him as a healer, and he acted upon that reputation. Now see, our reputations, our works, go before us as well. Because of that, we may hear the reputation of someone else and believe them to be either more or less worthy of Jesus Christ because of what they've done in their lives. You may look at someone and say that that person who continually sins over and over in the same way is not worthy of calling themselves a Christian. Or you may see the person who, who sins in a very particular way, whether it be a sin that's, that's in the news right now as a big controversial thing, or, or a sin that is so public in nature that you simply can't sweep it under the rug and ignore it. You may say that that person has gone too far, and you may take them and push them away from the church. Or conversely, we may consider others to be more worthy of Jesus, or more worthy of calling themselves a Christian, 
because of their perceived goodness and our perceived badness. But all of those things are just flat out wrong. We hear in Romans 3.23 that none are worthy for all have sinned. We hear this every week in our confession and absolution. We hear in 1 John 1.8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We hear this every week. The fact is, sin is of absolute utmost importance to God and he does not sweep it under the rug. To God, we are commanded to love him and to love one another with absolute perfection. And when we do not act towards one another or towards him in love, that is sin. And we know from Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. This is very important, folks. Our reputation to God in and of ourselves is that of sinner. And a sinner is nothing that he can abide. And there is nothing that we can do. There is no act that we can do to change that reputation with God. It's set. Our reputation is broken. Now, Jesus hears what the centurion is saying, and he counts the actions of the centurion as great faith. But we get this messed up. We get this twisted. We pick out the wrong thing as the part that's great faith. The centurion's confession of unworthiness is not the act of great faith. Any one of us can look within our own sinful hearts and say that we're not worthy of God. Even a, a horrible sinner can look at himself or herself and say, I am unworthy. That is not the act of great faith. The act of great faith is that this guy believed that Jesus had the authority and the power to fix that fact. This centurion believed that Jesus had the authority to heal all of his ills, the ill of the servant and the ill of the fact that he was unworthy. See, he knew that Jesus was healing people, and maybe he thought himself unworthy because he wasn't an Israelite or because he had been sitting and listening in the, in the synagogue that he had built, and he'd been hearing the word of God and recognizing his unworthiness. But regardless of all that, the fact is he knew that Jesus had the power and the will to heal his servant and to heal him. This shows us beyond the shadow of a doubt, that faith and powerful faith can come from places that we don't expect. Now, this centurion was a Gentile, not a Jew. He was a member of the party who had taken over the land of the Israelites. And yet he shows that he knows that he's not worthy. Think about the story of the Syrophoenician woman from Scripture. The Syrophoenician woman was a member of a nation who served false gods. Jesus knew this. He knew that they were an idolatrous nation. And this woman came to Jesus looking for healing, knowing that she wasn't worthy. Jesus called her a dog, said, it's not right to give the bread of the little children to the dogs. And what did she say in return? Even the dogs sit under the master's table and wait for scraps. She knew the power of the person that she was coming to. It didn't have to do with her reputation. It had to do with his reputation. And she had come to the right place. Both of these people are Gentiles, the Syrophoenician woman and the centurion. Both Gentiles, both unworthy, both wanting desperately for something greater than they know that they deserve. And both of them came to the right place. They came to the feet of Jesus Christ. These are two of the few people that Jesus praises in Scripture for their great faith. More often than not, we hear Jesus say, Oh, great faithless nation, how long will I have to deal with you? Here, Jesus says, I have never seen such great faith even in Israel. Worthiness is not a thing for us to grasp. That is not what we should be after. Because we cannot grasp worthiness. We by ourselves cannot make ourselves worthy. Our reputation is tarnished before God. Only Jesus Christ can make a person worthy. Only God has the authority to make a person clean and to call a person whole. And he does this through the saving work of Jesus Christ, making us righteous and worthy in the eyes of God. Only the Holy Spirit can open our eyes to the justifying work of Christ crucified and its value to us. The Jews thought that this centurion was worthy for all the wrong reasons. 
It wasn't about what the man had done for them that made him worthy. It wasn't his actions being the cause of his righteousness. His actions were the effect of his being made righteous. Only the indwelling of the Holy Spirit can cause such a changed heart that calls a servant by loving terms and recognizes his unworthiness. But the Holy Spirit's sanctifying work should be causing a burning urge within us to also begin to do the works that cause our fellow man to call us worthy. It pleases Jesus Christ to make us worthy of all of the free gifts of God. Jesus takes our tarnished reputation, that of broken sinner, and he covers over it with his own reputation. So now we get by on his reputation alone. It has nothing to do with us or our works. Earlier today, I was just getting ready to preach this in the first service, and it came to me uh, in our reading from Galatians this morning. Paul, he, he introduces himself in this way, and this is very important. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Normally, a letter like this, an epistle like this, would begin with, from Paul, grace and peace to you, from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. Sound familiar? But Paul saw fit and saw it necessary to introduce himself in a different way because Paul had been Saul of Tarsus. Paul had been worse than Shifu Roger could ever imagine. Paul had been attempting to destroy the church. He was that monster you don't want to see in a dark or light alley. He was the, the, the scourge of Christianity. And he introduces himself to the church in Galatia like this. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, has nothing to do with what I do. I'm a mess. I was a bad guy. But through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. The reputation of Christ precedes him. The reputation of Christ is what now gives him the right to preach in his name. And it is that reputation that Christ gives to us through our belief in him. There's a sermon in here somewhere. <laughs> Those who hear and believe Jesus' reputation of, as the healer of creation, we are blessed. We heard from Romans 6.23 what the wages of sin are. But Jesus says... The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is that life? Jesus in John 10 verse 10 says, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Life abundant in this world and life eternal in the next are the gifts of God that come through Jesus Christ. What does that life mean? When Jesus is asked, what are the commandments that are the most important? What is the most important commandment? Jesus says, Love God with everything you have. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's God's will for our lives. That's the Bible put down into two short lines. God's purpose for our lives is to love one another and to love him with everything that we have. And that kind of abundant, radical faith that allows us to be free to do so. Just like the faith shown by the centurion. That is what we're called to today. We're called to do that and we're called to do it abundantly. May we begin today to do all that God calls us to do with our lives and to do it more abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen.